Chapter 4 Lord Granville was not sure what on earth possessed him to offer the keepers of the robes his carriage for the duration of the travels. He might have hoped that the presence of ladies, especially one with whom he was now bound by a most delicious conspiracy, would enliven the journey. If so, he was to be sorely disappointed. Mrs Schwellenberg, this bastion of old-fashioned pannier skirts, was looking at him disapprovingly, and Miss Dudley kept an uncharacteristic silence. The older lady, Hugh noticed, was certainly not new to the chains of commanding. As soon as they settled in their seats, she put the glass separating the carriage from the open air down. Hugh couldn't account for her desire. The day was cold for spring, and still filled with the bracing chill of the night's rain. He didn't find the result altogether agreeable, but he said nothing. Poking fun at such battle-axes was one thing. Starting a brawl with a lady within the confines of one's vehicle at the beginning of a long journey was another. His gaze fell on Lavinia Dudley. There was a sensible shawl around her shoulders, but her hands, usually resting upon her knees, were now clutching it, pulling it tighter around herself. As a result, Hugh couldn't help but notice her shoulders were rather high and shapely. He also couldn't help but notice her eyes were rather reddish, as was her nose. Mrs. Schwellenberg, the authoress said, and Hugh was amazed by how tremulous her voice sounded. Would you mind putting the glass up again, please? Why? the older lady asked archly. Does fresh air displease you? No, of course not. It is only that I might have a mild cold. She sounded embarrassed by the fact, as though she might have contracted it on purpose. A mild cold, Mrs. Schwellenberg repeated. How very convenient. Do such illnesses always assail you at the prospect of any discomfort? If there was anything you disliked in life, no, in fact he disliked rather a lot of things, but plain unreason was always at the top of the list. I am no physician, he said, but it's evident even to my own eyes that Miss Dudley is unwell. Madame Hegerdon used to travel with me in winter in this manner she replied briskly, and she was a great deal older than Miss Dudley here, but complained very rarely at all. She had a maid make a concoction of milk and butter for her eyes afterwards, and did her duty. Miss Dudley's duty is to Her Majesty, not, he was sorely tempted to say, not to some jumped-up harpy, but Hugh held his tongue. Not to you, Mrs. Schwellenberg, with all due respect. Miss Dudley, do put the glass up. Lavinia Dudley obeyed him with the same silent efficiency with which she obeyed the first keeper of the robes in the first place, and the sight of it enraged Hugh more than any auteur in Miss Schwellenberg's speech, any unreason in her ways could have done. At the sight of this rebellion, the older woman nearly gasped. What manner is this? Miss Dudley, put the glass down at once. I will not have this behaviour from a woman of your kind. You will bear the air just fine. It's not as though it was January outside. Hugh had had enough. He leaned a little forward, not close enough to be an open intruder, but close enough for the older lady to feel a kind of a threat and said, as mildly as possible, You will have this behaviour, Mrs. Schwellenberg. Indeed, you will have any behaviour Miss Dudley would see fit to exhibit, even if she decides to dance on the roof of this vehicle, because this is my carriage. You probably think that I offered you a place in it out of deference to your exalted position and years. You are mistaken. I offered it to you because the idea amused me. If your tantrums will amuse me no longer, I am going to offer this place to another. Blood drained from Mrs. Schwellenberg's face. Miss Dudley was watching in numb, horrified fascination, as though an earthquake or the eruption of Vesuvius was unfolding in front of her very eyes. But Lord Grenville. You cannot be implying. You will simply exile me into another's care like a misbehaving schoolgirl. I very much can. Moreover, you will have to find another who will take you into his care yourself, because I am an impatient man and new to the ways of the court. I don't have many friends here to whom I could offer such an ordeal as your company without breaking the bonds of friendship forever. But the royal train is long, and I am sure you will find some kind soul among its carriages. Mrs. Schwellenberg's lips parted as though she was a fish gasping in dry air. Up close. The look was comical. Keep the glass up, Miss Dudley, Hugh added in a pleasant voice, leaning back. If this be a rebellion, I am giving you permission to rebel. 
The most famous theatre in Cheltenham, of the two that existed in the town at any rate, was a beautiful construction. It was smaller than those London theatres Lavinia once visited with her father years ago, in another life, but it was exquisitely decorated, and the velvet that decorated the boxes was freshly cut and deeply crimson. In another time, Lavinia would have greatly enjoyed the performance. It had been an eternity since she had been out on the town this way, enjoying great stories and observing other people who enjoyed them without any hurry. As it was, three things worried at her, preventing the enjoyment in question. One, they had only arrived in Cheltenham hours before and barely had time to freshen their appearances, let alone rest or eat. The grateful and patriotic citizens, however, expected their majesties to make an appearance in the royal box, and it would not have done to start the royal trip with disappointing grateful and patriotic citizens. Two, Lavinia was still shaken by the incident in the carriage. She knew she was going to pay for it in some other way, most likely by enduring a thousand more snipes and pinches than usual. Lavinia believed it a truth universally known that a person who cannot punish the exalted personage who snubbed them was going to look for a more vulnerable victim closer to home. But still, it had been startling to see Lord Granville to come to her defence. To see anyone at this court come to her defence. Lavinia had grown accustomed to a dutiful invisibility she had never really had to endure in her father's house. Three, tonight was supposed to be the first step in her, her and Lord Granville's plan. The first time she was to put her fine attire into use. It's a marvellous performance, isn't it? Lavinia ventured in a whisper, addressing one of the older equerries who accompanied them in their box. He was a widower, which Lavinia had ascertained through quiet inquiries before they left for Cheltenham. She was nothing if not thorough, and had resolved to stick to smooth and empty pleasantries to improve her odds. Instead of the widower replying, Kurt von Walmorden replied, It is, though it would have been more marvellous still if they had put on a school for scandal, as they had initially planned, instead of substituting it for the weakest version of King Lear known to man. I imagine the company feared to offend my esteemed relative sensibilities. The relative part was stretching it, and Lavinia knew it. Kurt von Walmorden was technically the grandson of the second George, but his father had been born of a liaison outside that late monarch's eventful marriage. It was a great clemency on the present king's part, she thought, to call the younger child of that unfortunate line from the small German court he usually resided in and give him a place among the splendour of St. James and Windsor. Not that the dark-haired buck looked particularly grateful just at the moment. The weakest version of King Lear? Lavinia asked, widening her eyes for effect, as though she had never heard about the famous rewrite that gave the bard's tragedy a happy ending. Men, she had heard plenty of times, did not like being contradicted much less corrected. She had never given this statement much thought before, for marriage was never in her plans. She had made herself useful as her father's amanuensis, and later earned a good living by her pen, and in neither of those situations did she want to leave the comforts of maidenhood. Now, however, she did not have a choice. It was transformation or prison. Therefore, she widened her eyes and leaned in to hear better. This version, the one where the virtuous daughter triumphs with an army and marries the no less virtuous hero, is a correction made merely decades ago, he explained. In the original, she dies in her father's arms. How very horrible, Lavinia somehow managed to say with a straight face, as if she, who had once been a great reader, could have conceivably never known of it. As if she, whose purpose in life was to craft stories, was the kind of person to think ancient tragedies horrible instead of cleansing. Do not worry, Miss Dudley. As you can see, the play has been updated for our more civilised age, and the good heroine is going to get her due. It's always a joy, isn't it, when virtue is rewarded? It depends on what the virtue in question is. Some claim weakness and inaction is a virtue. For a lady, that may be true, but I cannot imagine a man living by this pious claim and still holding any regard for himself. Then why on earth are you not out there fighting the French? Lavinia thought. But of course, she could not say so. 
I imagine your royal kinsman has all the regard in the world, and he is said to be the mildest of men. That he certainly is, Kurt von Walmolden agreed. However, I would not have wanted to live my life to say that I have only read of daring deeds in books. I understand it's different for you, Miss Dudley, you being a lady. Mrs. Schwellenberg, who was sitting to Lavinia's left hand, was not having the best of days or weeks, that much was plain. Lavinia noticed her sharp little glance at the last remark. It was not difficult to decipher. The king's own relative, if a distant one, and with a parent born on the wrong side of the blanket, had just paid Lavinia a grand compliment. He had not called her a woman. He had called her a lady. Lavinia resisted the temptation to glance at the back of the box where Lord Granville was currently sitting, and no doubt enjoying the play immensely, both plays. It is different, yes, Lavinia agreed meekly, showing her gratitude with a nod. I happen to know Cheltenham has good circulating libraries. It pays host to the best society after Bath and London, after all, and caters to all sorts of needs. Such as? The eagerness tore through her tone, however much Lavinia tried to conceal it. There is Mr. Harwood's library by the colonnade. Lavinia dropped her fan. She bent down for it, quicker than thought, unladylike, transported for a second into her earlier life, where there were no solicitous gentlemen to pick up the scarves and the shawls and the fans she happened to clumsily drop. But if she was quicker than thought, Kurt von Walmoden was quicker than her. His fingers closed around the handle first, and he whispered, barely audible, You're going to be dead three in the afternoon tomorrow. I do like this election. Lavinia only had a split second to reply, to decide how to reply. This was improbable. Impossible. Noblemen of his rank, even foreign ones, even the sons of royal bastards, did not fall for women like her with earnest intentions, with such ease. She was not the sort to enrapture a man. The chances he wanted anything but a chance liaison at best, and a cruel lesson to be taught to a scribbler at worst, were nil. And yet, she did not have any alternatives. Not at present. Lavinia had never been in a position to try to net a husband before, and, being born into a middlingly comfortable position in the world, and freed from the need of a spouse's support by her pen, she only saw the world of female desperation from a distance. She saw it well and clear. Indeed, she portrayed it in ruthless details, in her debut on a young lady's entry in the world. But it was one thing to see and to know, and another to feel the humiliation in her blood. To realise she simply had to take a chance with a man who most probably was no less a rake than Lord Granville, if not more so, because otherwise she might miss a chance at a serious courtship, and then all hope would be lost with it. She did not formulate these thoughts in perfect sentences, like lines upon lines in a lady's diary. They flashed through her head as an angry, degrading mixture. She nodded and resumed her seat. Is that a seemly conduct for a young woman? Mrs. Schwellenberg asked, almost as quietly as the dark-haired rogue had, when he invited Lavinia to the library. Lavinia froze. Whatever do you mean? She tried to conceal her nerves. She hoped the older lady had not overheard her secret agreement. Unfortunately, she was in a perfect position to overhear it since she was sitting only two steps away from Lavinia. I mean, Miss Dudley, that you seem to be losing all sense of shame. What kind of a young woman, with any sense of proper conduct, fetches her own fan from the floor? The hue of the last words was such as though she said it from the gutter. Lavinia sighed. The relief was such it set her head spinning as if her veins were suddenly drained of blood. Do forgive me, she said meekly, the very picture of a dutiful slipper-fetcher. It was my uncouth upbringing, rearing its head once again. Are you looking for something, young man? The proprietor of the circulating library addressed Hugh with respect, without deference. A man keeping such an establishment in a modish place like Cheltenham, one who had already lived through one royal visit before, must have been fairly accustomed to visitors in well-tailored clothes and tight cravats. Yes, Hugh thought, I am looking for the woman who doesn't seem to be able to keep herself out of trouble. 
Aloud, however, he merely said, Thank you, Mr. Howard. I am merely thinking. Are you sure? We have splendid quarto editions of the best histories, not to mention books on divinity. The elderly proprietor paused, evidently deciding a young buck of the court was unlikely to be interested in such lofty theological matters, and he added, We have the latest novels, too. Do you have Dudley's Miranda, too? Hugh asked, not without some impishness on his mind. Oh, I'm so sorry, Mr. Lord Granville. Hugh had no idea why he was at Mr. Harwood's library at this hour. If someone had asked him why he was there, he would have unlikely been at a loss for words, a situation unfamiliar to him. But whether he would have replied something approaching truth or even admitted as much to himself was another matter. Upon thinking about it, his response would most likely be something about being bored senseless of what passed for drama in Cheltenham, if yesterday's evening was any indication, and wanting to see some real thing. The truth was that he didn't like Kurt von Walmoden's whispers one bit. There was sense in the saying that it takes one to know one, and if Hugh was ever anything approaching a rake, or at least what passed for a rake at this prudish court, he knew the royal relative was no family man either. For one thing, he didn't have a family. Not that the possession of a wife ever prevented men of the tongue from seeking diversions elsewhere, but to keep things fair, the same things could be said of the wives. That was not the kind of world Hugh wanted Lavinia Dudley to enmesh herself in. His plan was to play Cupid for a change and sneak her into matrimonial bliss under the nose of the Cerberus that watched her, not to make her into a nobleman's mistress. For one thing, one had to have some sympathy for the nobleman. She was like to bore him stiff by reading him lectures on proper decorum in bed and attempting to regulate his consumption of port outside it. I'm so sorry, your lordship, she is ever popular, and I don't think we have a copy left at the moment. Now, if you were to wait until someone returned one, it's a shame she hasn't written a new piece for so long. Hugh glanced at the door. The courting couple was to appear at any moment. He wasn't sure why the smooth proceeding of his plan irritated him to no end. Perhaps it was because he knew that such interest as Kurt von Walmulden expressed in the dowryless authoress did not necessarily lead down the aisle. Oh, yes, but who can blame her? Even ladies of unimpeachable virtue sometimes succumb. Whatever do you mean? There is talk on the street that she had come to court to find a husband and found herself a gentleman protector instead. What an utter Banbury tale, Hugh exclaimed. Even if someone offered Miss Dudley such a thing, she never would have agreed to it. Why would they not have offered it? I've never seen her, but by all accounts, she is a pretty young woman. Hugh opened his mouth to deny this allegation and then paused. Lavinia Dudley was no ravishing beauty, that was true. She would never lay waste to a ballroom full of suitors with a glance. The slow and ceremonious manner imposed on her by court did not lend her any allure either, at least from Hugh's perspective. He had little time for the kind of pastel-coloured misses extolled by conduct books. But she had a pleasant face, white arms, a softness to her features, eyes of bright blue, and, most of all, there was something unnameable something smouldering beneath the iron regimen. Hugh recalled the evening of the concert and her vehement denials of needing any help. Her words were nonsensical and infuriating, but there was a kind of fire in her eyes no decorum could conceal. She is pretty, he finally said. She is quite remarkably pretty, in fact. But there is no woman I've ever known who conducted herself with greater regard for her reputation. If gossips in the street seek to attach the name of a light skirt to someone, let them look someplace else. You are quite a vehement defender of the fair sex, I see, your lordship. No, I am not. I'm the last person lady should call upon for defence. If you are acquainted with Miss Dudley, Mr Harwood continued, could you pass my wife's regards to her? Margaret has read and reread Miranda at least a dozen times by now, and claims the resolution of the plot brings her great solace. She has lent the copy to our daughter, too, and now they speak in the cryptic language of quotes that excludes me from the conspiracy. You haven't read her novel yourself, then? 
Modern novels are not to my taste. Richardson I can abide, but only in a certain mood. Usually I read the Romans. You should make an exception for Miss Dudley and heed not the rumours. Can you blame the gossips? She hasn't written another work for two years by now. It's not the height of unreason to suppose she might have found herself another occupation. Her only occupation so far has been serving Her Majesty. Otherwise known as the prissy German creature in voluminous robes and a fortress of prudery. Her thoughts are occupied by nothing else. If you insist, Your Lordship. You of all people should know the difference between the truth and the fable. He was surprised by his own stubbornness. Was it Miss Dudley's dark influence turning him into a bore? Any other time, any other woman, he would have laughed at the notion that such a rule-abiding creature could be thought to be someone's voluptuous mistress. Perhaps he would have even supplied an outlandish tale or two himself, just for the lark of it. But it was not the same with Miss Dudley. She was almost his protégé now. Her fine feelings were a different matter. He didn't mind puncturing her sense of the proper himself sometimes, but it was different if someone else tried to do it, utterly different. He felt rather proprietor-like over the feelings in question. There was a shuffle of familiar feet behind him and the sound of the door being closed. Without turning toward the newcomers, Hugh said, Actually, I very much would like to look at your rare quarters. Do you happen to have any in the back rooms? Chapter 5 Lavinia would have lied if she said she felt no trepidation at coming to Mr. Harwood's. True, a circulating library was a daylit, public place, and one where few people would have suspected even a court pair of debauchery. But still, she knew how fleeting the attentions of high-born gentlemen could be. Not on her own skin, of course, thank God. She had always been too careful to enmesh herself in such situations, but she had read and heard enough tales of woe. She had written a whole novel on the subject of fine lines between propriety and ruin. She knew she had to choose her words carefully. When Lavinia saw Lord Granville engaged in a conversation with a man who was presumably Mr. Harwood, she froze. There was no possibility at all that his visit to the library was an accident. He must have overheard her conversation with Kurt von Walmolden at the theatre and decided to follow her. Whatever was his reason? Lavinia wasn't about to think even for a minute that the golden-haired rake cared a whit about her safety and had come here for her sake. At best, he was worried she would not be able to conduct the conversation well on her own and thought he would need to interject. At worst, eavesdropping on her tentative courtship was his idea of fun. Lavinia was not about to give him any. She marched to one of the bookcases and turned to the neatly ordered shelves. She avoided touching anything and pretended to be tremendously interested in the rows of sermons. It did not take long for a gentleman with dark hair and a mild German accent to join her. Miss Dudley. Kurt von Wolmolden inclined his head in a barely perceptible gesture. Always a pleasure to see you. I can say the same. We don't have much time. I am expected at a vital engagement, so let us be clear. He touched the spine of Fordyce's sermons to young women without much ceremony. I think I know of your predicament. Do you? You're unhappy at court. You want an escape. His whisper was low. I can provide you with it. Lavinia whipped her head around, looking at him face to face. Her brain refused to believe the frankness of his words. It couldn't have been that easy. Her life might have been sheltered after a fashion, but even she knew nothing one desired simply fell into one's lap like an overripe fruit, especially if one was a woman, however young, however pretty, however fine her newly made clothes. You are very generous, Herr von Walmolden, Lavinia said cautiously, especially given my station in life. Your station in life is an asset. Is it? The cogs in her mind were whirring. Was he trying to horrify the ton by finding himself the most unsuitable bride possible? Was he trying to conceal some vice by a hasty marriage? Was he so deep in debt that genuinely well-portioned women refused to countenance him as a husband? Of course. After all, you flit beneath everyone's notice. Everyone at this court is watching everyone else, that is true, but you, 
are watched much less than others are. A second keeper of the robes. Forgive me, but it is no exalted title. Lavinia saw clearly that he didn't mean to wound her. He was merely observing the reality, and her station in life was as much a reality as the blue colour of the sky. A wise thing to do would have been to perceive it as no slight and accept it graciously. So why on earth did it sting so much? No. Lavinia turned her face away to the books again. No, it is not. But in that case, your offer is all the stranger. You have not heard my offer yet. Are there so many options? You may be surprised, Miss Dudley. You may be very well surprised. Something must have reflected on her face, for the next thing she heard was Kurt von Walmolden's low, soft laughter. You couldn't have thought I was going to ask for your hand, could you? Of course not, Lavinia did her best to reply with dignity. The thought entered my mind, but only as an example of something utterly preposterous. That speaks well of your sense. I don't need your charms, Miss Dudley. I need your modesty, your quiet ways. In short, I need your assistance. Assistance in what? There is a young lady who came to my notice during the last royal visit to Cheltenham. I should very much like to renew our acquaintance. Why on earth would you need my assistance in courtship? The lady is no pauper, but not the sort of woman their majesties might have in mind for me either. You know the gossips of the court. Such things need to be managed discreetly. Lavinia did not ask what he meant by such things. She merely looked at him, prompting him silently. This, she knew, was one of the better ways to draw words out of people without looking too determined. Eldest daughters learnt plenty of such tricks when growing up. The dark-haired nobleman did not resist that insistent gaze any more than her father or stepmother ever did. Letters. Trinkets. I need a trustworthy go-between to pass such things on. If everything goes well, I promise to hint to Her Majesty that it may be better if you were released from her service. If everything goes well? Lavinia could not manage the sharpness in her voice. She sensed all too well the solid universe behind these four words. If my acquaintance with Miss Peabody reaches a happy conclusion. Somehow, being now able to put a name to the nebulous figure of his victim-to-be, made Lavinia feel worse. I am not going to assist in someone's seduction and ruin, she said flatly, trying to still the angry shivering in her hands. Such dreadful words! Did you read them in a novel? You are forgetting yourself, Herr von Wormolden. No, I am afraid it is you who is forgetting yourself, or rather forgetting the truth of your situation. Remember, Miss Dudley, if I can influence Her Majesty to let you go, I can just as well tell her that you are an incomparable ornament and the court simply cannot do without you. You would not do it only because I refused your scheme. It is not your place to tell me what I can and cannot do. I... She means to say... Another man joined the conversation, his voice sounding assured and bright, even when lowered to a manageable whisper that she agrees to your offer. Lavinia turned on her heel and saw Lord Granville standing behind her, leaning in as though he was a part of this dispute, as though it were his decision to make, as though it was his soul to sell. I absolutely do not, she hissed, forgetting her manners for a moment. Lord Granville, I think you've rendered me quite enough assistance. It's always a pleasure to deal with reasonable people. Kurt von Walmolden commented, Grenville, I trust you'll be able to bring your little friend here to her senses. She has merely been overwhelmed by the generosity of your offer, Lord Granville replied cheerfully. For a second, Lavinia wanted to claw his eyes out, as though she were some wild hoyden from a comedic play. Do you even realise what he is asking of us? she asked angrily. Of me? Of course. It's not to murder an orphan, though judging by your tone, one might have thought otherwise. It's to assist the course of love. Love? You are merely mocking me. You know as well as I do that love has nothing to do with it. Miss Dudley, lovers have passed notes and gifts to each other since times immemorial. Ovid writes about it quite vividly. I haven't read Ovid, 
Lavinia said, with all the hauteur she could muster. In truth, she found there was little pride to be found in not having read something, however scandalous the material, but she was not about to have Lord Granville know it. I should lend you my copy. It's a very instructional read. There is nothing outrageous in what Herr von Walmoden wants to do. It's not as though he's planning to waylay and force the poor thing. He would be merely giving her a choice. She might send the trinkets away, should she wish to, and then goodness will triumph and angels shall rejoice. What if she doesn't? What poor opinion do you have of the mysterious Miss Peabody? Lord Granville was plainly enjoying himself now. Think of it. What value does her virtue have if it's not battle-tested? Have you ever heard of a saint who has never encountered temptation? It would be like calling someone a great warrior because he never faced an enemy attack. Put away with words you have, your lordship. From a woman of your talent, I'd take it as a compliment. If you so wish, Lavinia said, making it plain, it wasn't intended as such. Most likely, even if the lady had known him before, she would have recognised, with years, that such an acquaintance can bring her naught but grief and is probably going to reply to his letters with about the same expression as you are giving me now, only rendered into a written word. That was certainly possible. Lavinia couldn't help but acknowledge. If Miss Peabody had a sensible bone in her body, she was likely to do just that. But in that case, she turned to the son of the royal bastard, her cheeks still hot. You told me you are going to help me only if your courtship reaches a happy conclusion. What if Miss Peabody refuses you? It's a good question. Lord Granville intervened yet again. What is Miss Dudley going to get in that case? How will I know Miss Dudley was not the one who influenced her in that direction? Kurt von Walmoden asked, not without reason, for that was precisely what Lavinia was now secretly hoping to do. I am going to watch over her, Lord Granville replied, as though that was the most natural thing in the world. We shall be joined at the hip like a sister and a brother as long as this mission lasts. I will trust you, if you give me your word as a gentleman. I would. The sickening irony of that demand, as long as Lavinia was concerned, was something worthy of a satirical novel. In that case, Kurt von Walmotten said, I promise to render my assistance as soon as their majesties return from Cheltenham, provided you carry out every task I give you. Not before, and not in any other instance. What do you think of that, Miss Dudley? The question was a silken sham. He wasn't interested in what she thought of these conditions, for he was not going to offer any other alternative. Lavinia felt as though the walls of unseen castle walls, ancient walls, walls breathing dark histories, were closing in on her. She was standing in the daylight in an open modern room, made airy with high ceilings and decorated with antique busts, and yet she felt like the heroine of one of her tortured tragedies. Perhaps it had always been like this. For each generation of silent court ladies, the companions to the Queen, since the days of half-nameless medieval consorts and the bloody Tudor wives, countless women to give their mistresses slippers and prayer books, to fetch shawls for them and keep their sleep, and then disappear into the shadows. But unlike them, Lavinia Dudley, the child of an enlightened age, had a way out. The way out was standing right in front of her. She was going to resolve this dilemma somehow. She was going to carry out the devilish task without sullying her conscience forever. She only needed to find a way. Very well, Lavinia said, her fingertips touching four dice, almost feeling the regimen of sermons on proper attire and chaste conduct marching inside. I will help you, Herr von Walmolden. But... Once again, Lord Granville answered for Lavinia before she opened her mouth. You must give Miss Dudley a promise that you are going to uphold your part of the bargain. Indeed, the other man replied, I give you my word as a gentleman. You really didn't have to pay for my subscription to the assembly rooms, Lavinia Dudley whispered as Hugh led her into the hot, cramped ballroom that was the shining centre of Cheltenham's genteel society. It was only half a guinea. I could afford it. I do draw wages as the second keeper of the robes. It was obvious Miss Dudley was in a huff tonight. The reason was not difficult to divine either. 
Tonight was her first task, or maybe it was their first task, for Kurt von Walmoden. A note was to be passed to Miss Peabody from her high-born admirer. Even in a huff, Miss Dudley looked exquisite, shining with a kind of pale intensity even the corseted life of the court couldn't dim. It was this radiance, the looks of a silver-skinned virgin from a continental fresco, that first drew Hugh to her on the night of the royal ball. I do wonder which one of them is Miss Peabody, he said, steering his thoughts consciously away from Miss Dudley. It's a shame she is not of so grand a rank as to have her portrait painted. Had she been of so grand a rank, she would not have attracted his attention, Miss Dudley said with nervous archness. She clearly avoided using Kurt von Walmelden's name, or the name of any participant in this scheme, aloud. After all, great ladies are protected by their families. Miss Peabody, I imagine, has no one. Do you think she lives on the street, then? In that case, it's strange she would be admitted to the upper assembly rooms. You are joking again. Guilty as charged. Besides, she has an aunt. He mentioned as much. An aunt would not fight a duel for your honour. That depends on the aunt. Hugh had barely finished speaking when he heard a faint, ladylike laughter. The source of the sound was not far, and when he turned his head in that direction, he glimpsed the most exquisite redhead he had ever seen. Petite, grey-clad and grey-eyed, she would not have been all that different from the other misses populating the assembly rooms on the night of the Friday ball, had it not been for the violent red of her hair. It seemed to be burning like a crown of flame. The young woman met his gaze frankly. Then, as though recalling some unwritten rule, she lowered her eyes in a show of modesty. Miss Dudley, Hugh said, I believe we have found our quarry. Engineering an introduction through the Master of Ceremonies was not the most difficult task Hugh had ever encountered. If anything, it was as easy as opening a well-oiled door. Not so much because of who he was, necessarily, or even because of his title, and an estate whose lands were not far from here, but because he was now known to be a part of the court. The royal court was a place from which all nobility and generosity of the land flowed, and granted all the blessings to the town it deigned to visit. The girl's aunt, introduced to him as Mrs. Atwell, nodded politely at Lavinia. However, Hugh captured her undivided attention. All that was required of him was to think of a word of praise for her charge's conduct. Lord Granville, she gushed, what a great honour you do us with your compliment. Madeline, do not stand as though a pillar of salt. Thank his lordship. Madeline Peabody murmured a word of thanks, gently and quietly. She raised her eyes from the floor and looked at him with demure doe eyes, eyes almost too perfect to be true. Lavinia fidgeted by his side. The note was hidden in her sleeve, but she could not pass it on to Miss Peabody while her guardian was watching. Lord Granville, she said, I do believe a new allemande is starting. Do you have a liking for the music? I always did. That surprised him. He'd always thought the proper and studious Miss Dudley had much preferred the cotillions of court balls, not the lively music of the assembly rooms. He imagined her skipping around in a reel or a good country dance, her ankles already daringly apt to be glimpsed by those new gowns of hers, bared blithely with every jump. Dancing was an energetic pastime, even more energetic than bed sport in his experience, although, of course, both depended on the partner, and her face would probably be flushed in no time. Hugh wondered how that pretty shade of crimson would look against her pale gold hair. So does Madeline, Mrs Atwell interjected. She is a very accomplished dancer. Hugh saw something insistent in Lavinia's eyes. Do forgive me, Mrs Atwell, Hugh said with all the charm he could muster, but Miss Dudley has already promised me the first dance. I would be honoured, however, to invite your niece for the second. You are most kind, your lordship, Madeline Peabody whispered, her grey eyes soft. I am glad to accept your invitation. The musician struck the first note of the Allemande. The master of ceremonies beamed as soon as he saw Hugh and Lavinia take hands, and he gestured for them to step forward as the leading couple. Wasn't that wonderful? Nothing to excite the blood like conducting secret dealings in the bright-lit heart of a ballroom. Usually, Hugh was all in favour of anything that excited the blood. 
he couldn't help but notice the stiffening of Miss Dudley's expression. Not so much disapproval as terror. Her sharing of his taste didn't go so far as this. That was quite a shame. Keeping the smile on his lips, Hugh took her hand in preparation for leading the dance. It was the first time, it occurred to him, he could do so. It was peculiar he hadn't touched her flesh yet, even through the chaste gloves. He had been in her room, her inner sanctum, as well as a place of sleep and work, but he had never touched her. Her palm in his hand was hot and sweaty. Worry not, he murmured as they moved through the ballroom. It's all going to go smoothly as butter. Do you feel no regret that it will? Miss Dudley replied just as quietly. In lieu of an answer, Hugh set her spinning. The spring green gown immediately rose in a whirl of colour, her ankles thin and slender beneath it. Hugh blinked and willed himself to look away. The scheme that had started as a diversion already had enough complications. Though I imagine you don't. Lavinia was breathing quickly, her cheeks indeed tinged with a little pink now. Her voice was acid with disapproval, but she was looking at him with those widened eyes that bespoke excitement. I imagine you have quite a dozen of Madeleines in your own past. Perhaps I do. But they were not unmarried damsels. None of them were, in fact. Truly? She blinked, the moment of her arms a bit tardy compared to his more practised figures. None? You might be surprised, Miss Dudley, but I gain no pleasure from ruining women's lives. There was such profound doubt in her expression that Hugh almost felt insulted. I may be a rake, as you have doubtless heard. He leaned closer, her face only a few inches from his now. He could see the pale blue of her eyes disintegrate into multiple flecks and shades of blue. But a finished scoundrel I am not. I hope you understand if I thought you a man more... careless with his pleasures. She still sounded angry. What on earth was the matter with her? Did she disapprove of every kind of night shared between those not husband and wife? Unless... No. That was impossible. Here's Lavinia Dudley, his silver-skinned virgin from a mural, could not have possibly been jealous. Oh, I promise you, Miss Dudley, when the situation calls for it, I can be very careful with my pleasures indeed. She was flushed now, and he could wager Granville Hall against a rented lodging in Covent Garden that dancing had only a little to do with it. Miss Dudley pressed the paper into his palm when their hands interlocked next. She did so in a hurry, as though her task required her to touch open flames. Miss Peabody was waiting for him to lead her into the next dance, when his dance with Miss Dudley ended. She said little when Hugh took her hand. She said less through the first set of figures. She danced much better than Miss Dudley, Hugh noticed, or gracefully so at any rate. But he supposed, when one was the daughter of a squire, even one who was unwise with his fortune and unlucky with sons who could have safeguarded what was left of it, she could concentrate all her energies of crafting herself into a perfection of marriageability. How did you meet His Majesty's nephew? Hugh asked, when the perfection in question stopped her whirling. Nephew sounded much more genteel than half-nephew by a bastard brother, and took less time to say. During the first royal visit to Cheltenham, Miss Peabody replied, her smile unchanging. My father was still alive then. I was one of the ladies selected to meet the party. Hugh could imagine it well. From what he had heard, Simeon Moreau, who was selected as the master of ceremonies for the whole visit back then, was in charge of attending to their majesties, as well as to the less distinguished members of the royal family. It was not difficult to suppose he drew the prettiest flowers of the local squires and gentry in order to ornament the welcome. I see, he said. Did you curtsy before him in a particularly exquisite way? I presented him with an embroidery, his family crest, she smiled, three rams and a helmet of black and gold. It was no wonder von Walmolden was captivated by her, for the younger son of a bastard, orbiting a court much more glittering than that of his own family's, it must have been heady to encounter such breathless regard. Besides, he did not doubt that Miss Peabody's needlework, like everything else about her, was careful and well executed. When he passed the note into her palm, she grasped it 
as though it were a rope thrown to someone drowning. The smile never left her lips. Chapter 6 Granville? The familiar voice sounded incredulous. Hugh turned and saw Sir Stephen Prescott, the companion of his childhood, who was a keen horseman with broad shoulders. Guilty as charged, Hugh replied, looking at Sir Stephen Prescott. I didn't expect to see you here. Hugh raised his eyebrows. I can take myself away if the sight is displeasing to you. Ever joking, aren't you? I have heard of the royal visit, but I could not imagine you would have any desire to visit the Friday ball here. You must be used to better ballrooms by now. More exalted company, too. More exalted company? Hugh thought of his fellow equerries with their arts of careful dancing around the issue of the king's illness, a dancing with more elaborate figures than any he had seen here tonight. He thought of the aristocratic ladies-in-waiting, silent by their queen's side. He thought of the strange isolation of the place, its existence to the rhythm of its own internal clocks. Exalted company, for sure. There was something in it of the rarefied air of a monastery high in the snow-capped mountains. He wasn't about to say any of that to his old friend, nor even ruminate on it over much himself. He had a duty to his family name, and the duty was what he was going to fulfil. When Miss Dudley was going to flit out of the court with the same peculiar chance that made her enter it in the first place, she would betray no one's memory. If he were to do so, it would be another matter entirely. I am here for Miss Dudley's sake. He didn't lie, technically. Though I would have come still, had I known you were frequenting the town now. Forgive me, would you mind introducing your lady to me? Of course, Miss Dudley, this is Sir Stephen Prescott, a man I had the honour of calling my friend ever since his family came to visit Granville Hall at my tender age of nine. Sir Stephen, this is Lavinia Dudley, who is, likewise, my good friend. That explanation would do. A good friend. Such a murky definition when it came to pretty young women. Sir Stephen's face lit up as though he had bagged a particularly plump partridge on an autumn hunt. A good friend, I see. Well, I have always thought it's high time you had a good friend and companion. I don't believe I have heard of your family. Sir so Stephen looked closely at her. You were not of the Northumberland Dudleys, by any chance? A smile touched Miss Dudley's lips at the notion that she could be descended from the famed family that produced the Dukes of Warwick. She's one of the ladies who serve Her Majesty, he said quickly, sidestepping the question. It was confusing enough that Sir Stephen thought her Hugh's bride-to-be. It would be worse if he heard the novelist's no doubt painfully honest answer, and later took him aside to ask Hugh what he was thinking, courting a girl with nothing but loveliness to recommend her. Loveliness and talent, and more unbending morals than any he had encountered in any young woman, or young man, of the ton or the court alike. Stubbornness also and a great gift at eating oneself alive. That's splendid. It's a shame your old man isn't here to see Miss Dudley, isn't it? I remember he was always trying to find you a good match with this neighbour's girl or that. Of course, if he had been here, you wouldn't have been at court. Of course, he loved Granville Hall, but Prescott, this is quite enough. I'm sure Miss Dudley isn't interested in these old tales. I wouldn't say they were so old, but let no one claim that Stephen Prescott doesn't take a hint. His friend always had all the tact and subtlety of a bore. Hugh was already feeling Lavinia Dudley's anxious, curious stare upon himself. The sensation was not unpleasant, oddly enough. It was only a shame she was only attracted to the murky waters behind Sir Stephen's words, and not to anything to do with Hugh himself. Given that the moral harness she imposed upon herself was hardly less strict than that of Queen Charlotte herself, it was highly unlikely she ever would be. What happened to your father? Lavinia asked as they stepped out upon the balcony. They were not alone. Two young women, sisters by the looks of them, were laughing in the other corner. So Lavinia had no fears regarding the propriety of the situation. Now she would only have to speak in a low, soft voice so as to avoid anyone eavesdropping. Fortunately, the years at court had taught her this skill, whether she wanted to learn it or not. He died, Miss Dudley, a sadly common fate for men his age. You are jesting still. I've heard your friend. 
He couldn't have meant death alone. Why not? Why did your father live out his last years at his estate if he was such a brilliant courtier? Lavinia knew she was prying, and she knew it was not right. But there was something about this man, this co-conspirator of hers, that made her natural passions, be that curiosity or anger, well up, drowning propriety in their wake. Brilliant courtiers rarely stay brilliant courtiers all their lives. Read any account of the lives of those who are close to good Queen Bess, or her father. I've read plenty of them, Lavinia parried. Surely you aren't going to tell me that your father had been exiled for plotting with the Spanish? Of course not. We live in a more genteel age, after all, don't we? The conversation with Sir Stephen must have torn at something in him, for there was now an unmistakable ire in his voice. We have smaller crimes. Then he did nothing so terrible. Not if you ask Her Majesty's opinion on the matter. Queen Charlotte? Was it her who exiled him? Of course not. She is such a proper wedded wife, after all, and would never dream of usurping her husband's power in these matters. She would simply whisper in his ear. If he abides by her whispers, who can blame him? Lord Granville? Lavinia stepped closer and put her hand upon his arm. What has your father done? Nothing. Nothing that merited his fall. He was protecting a woman he knew since she was a girl. His intended? No, Caroline Mathilde. Who? Lavinia realised where she had heard this name. The night, the terror, the ramblings of a mad king. Do you remember what happened to poor Mathilde when father sent her away? King George's sister, the one who went to Denmark. I trust you know her story. There was a time, father said, it was thrumming through every chamber at court. Upon seeing Lavinia shake her head, he added, though I suppose for most people it's old news now, yesterday's papers. She died in cell, not long after you were born, after all, or me, for that matter. But it was, by the end of father's life, the only story it seemed he had left in him to tell. Can you tell it to me now? Lavinia asked quietly. It's a long tale, very bard-like in its way. It does sometimes seem to belong to the days of good Queen Bess. Or her father. Perhaps especially her father. I told you Her Majesty is not the sort of woman to try and usurp her husband's power. Well, Caroline Mathilde, Queen Caroline Mathilde, as she was by then, was precisely that sort of woman. It's not right, not usually, but her husband was a brute and a madman and not a benevolent madman like His Majesty either. She found a lover a court physician. An enlightened man, everyone said, as enlightened as she was accomplished. They seized the throne together. She made him regent. He made her a queen reigning, not a consort weeping in the shadows as she was before. An outrageous woman, father said, and he used to know her as a boisterous young girl. As I grew, some of his tales prickled my blood more than others did. When she told me how she as queen used to ride the streets of Copenhagen incognito in a man's garments and take part in archery contests, I thought, God, how I wish I could have bedded this woman. Lord Granville! What's the matter, Miss Dudley? You have blood enough to hear about high treason, but not about matters of the flesh? How did it all end? Bloodily, of course. Both arrested after a masked ball. The physician was tortured for confession and then broken on the wheel, still wearing the finery from the fate. I did tell you it was a dark, old-fashioned tale. You aren't pale, I see. I've read worse in Titus Andronicus. You are ready to faint at impropriety, but not at the mention of executions. You're a curious thing. I do not faint at impropriety. I merely dislike it. Why so? Because I am afraid of it. The words were out of her mouth before she could stop them. Something changed in Lord Granville's expression, and the brief levity sank back into the swamp. As it turns out, Queen Caroline Matilde should have been more afraid of it still. She was to be sent back to her brother's domain after she was dethroned by her own mother-in-law. That doesn't seem such a dire fate to me. She must have longed for her days of girlhood sometimes. Oftentimes, Lavinia wished her own girlhood continued indefinitely. It was comfortable to her to remain a flitting shadow, glowing by her father's side, much, much better than being at the centre of attention 
as the mistress of a household. It wouldn't have been a dire fate, no, except it didn't come to pass. Her Majesty claimed she would rather lie down and die on the spot than allow that amoral woman into the same court as her virginal, pure little daughters. She coaxed and coaxed, pleaded and pleaded until her royal husband agreed and forbade his own sister her own native shores. Her Majesty didn't even want him to allow her Hanover. Its court, after all, was known for loose morals, and who knew what mischief a woman of spirit and ambition could wreak there? No, she made sure her disgraced in-law went to Sel. Sel? I think I know the name. Isn't it the place where... Something scratched at the edges of Lavinia's mind. Some gothic tale so distant, it gained almost mythological outlines. Where the very first King George imprisoned his discarded wife until her death? Yes, the very one. Father was against sending Queen Caroline Mathilde there. He tried to talk his majesty out of it, even though he knew his royal wife will not like the interference. He failed. His majesty's sister died in cell, not yet thirty. And father was exiled from court as soon as her majesty could contrive it. She does not forget that one and she does not forgive. How did you become a royal equerry, then? The summons arrived a mere month after father's death. I was as surprised as you are. But I've heard whispers since. Hints that his majesty, in one of his lucid moments, regretted his old friend's exile and death, and wanted to make amends to his son. Give our family another chance. You came to the court that cost your father his position and possibly his life? I am the only son of the Granvilles. I have no living brothers. The proximity to the throne was what gave father his standing and wealth before the former was snatched away. Who is going to repair it if not me? I would have never thought you to be a man so caught up in duty. Why on earth else do you suppose I accepted the position, let alone remained in it? Do you suppose I so enjoy spending my life making a king who dreams of dead friends walking and invents illusions for his wife presentable to the public? Do you imagine taking daily turns on the terrace with him is what I dreamed about when I was a boy? If the position at court is so crucial to you, why are you jeopardising it by... A realisation suddenly pierced Lavinia's brain, and it was as though a bucket of icy water was upturned upon her whole person, your plan, she said slowly. Your desire to get me away from the court, it was to be a little revenge, wasn't it? Rob Queen Charlotte of her prized pet. Not quite an equal reckoning for what she did to your father, but a fine little twist still. I've always thought you were a clever thing. You wanted to make use of me. I wanted to make a trade with you. My assistance for yours. A goodly trade it is if the other merchant doesn't know the contents of the sack. Are you such an ardent admirer of Her Majesty's virtue that these contents disgust you? I... Had this conversation happened but a few months, or even hours ago, Lavinia would have replied that she was, vehemently so. But now she was at a loss for words. Worse, she was at a loss for a firm decision in her own mind. Lord Granville had no reason to lie to her. If what Lord Granville told her was true, that meant Queen Charlotte was not simply a woman of stark purity herself, not simply a woman demanding the same of those around her, but also the kind of woman who would deny an exile what was essentially her family home for these principles. The kind of woman who would ruin a man for opposing them and her. Lavinia wasn't about to throw her allegiances to the wind. After all, if she did, it would have meant she had spent those last strangling her own discontent, smothering her feelings and silencing her voice for an empty honour. That would have been too much. She was, however, shaken sufficiently to hesitate with her reply. Lord Granville smirked. I knew they didn't. You are a clever thing, as I've said. You have a mind of your own, even if you need to be angered to bring it out. You are an impertinent, disrespectful... Lord Granville snaked an arm around her waist, pulled her close and kissed her on the mouth. A wave of panic crashed over Lavinia's head. She glimpsed to the left an empty balcony. The Laughing Sisters must have long since gone inside. The fact should have alarmed Lavinia more. 
she was now alone with a notorious rake, and should he try anything horrid, there would be no one to help, and should someone intrude upon them and discover her in his grasp, she would be ruined. She had never been kissed on the lips before, and never had any desire for it. Little sensual disobediences of rebellious daughters were not for her, but now she wondered if that stemmed from genuine virtue or from the simple fact that no man worth disobedience had come her way in all these years. Lord Granville's kiss was certainly worth a disobedience. Heated and insistent, it was possibly worth a whole treason. His hands slid down her back and stopped at her waist, just as she had imagined him doing with his shadowy conquest the night she went to the Queen. His fingers were warm like the spring twilight, and their warmth seemed to burn through the muslin and her shift, branding her skin beneath. He released her mouth and drew back, a kind of daze in his forest green eyes. The music from the room started again after a pause, and Lavinia became consciously aware of the couples whirling and skipping and jumping mere metres from where she was committing a heinous mistake. For that was what it was a heinous mistake. Women in her position, women without dowries and fragile in the world, had been ruined for less. It was impossible Lord Granville didn't know that. Is it a further plan of revenge? she asked, her voice still breathless, and loathed herself for that breathlessness. To ruin the Queen's reading pet, if you won't be able to snatch her away? Do you really think that I could look at you? and think of something as cold and rational as revenge. Do you think any man could? Yes, because I am not, as you have yourself once informed me, a ravishing beauty. Revenge is the most logical reason someone would try to ruin someone like me. Did I say that? I was a fool. You are ravishing to me. If other men disagree with me, it's their own blindness and does not concern me. You cannot marry me, your lordship. The address was a deliberate bit of coldness. You've all but said it. You need to repair your family's position at court. You would need a highborn wife for that. If you intend to dally with me without marrying, then you are a worse cad than I thought, and a liar besides, since you've told me about your rules never to seduce unmarried women. You overestimate my powers of rational thinking if you think that something as deliberate as intentions for the future entered my mind when I kissed you. But now that you lay it out, you were right, of course. He stepped away from her, a bitter smile touching his soft lips. I promise in the future to only kiss married ladies. But the realisation they were alone, with no one to interrupt them, strangely emboldened her. After a second's hesitation, born of shock and inexperience, Lavinia found herself responding to his kiss. <laughs>